Welcome to Lift Your Leg. This is Winnie Cansey from the Naughty Dog in Victoria, BC, author of As a Dog Thinketh. And Jill Brown from Calgary, Alberta, the bag lady. Today we are going to talk about reactive dogs. This is our third part in this series. I want to focus on the human part of the leash. I teach a four-day boot camp and in that four days we work so much on the human end of the leash. We also work on the dog part, but by intensively working on the humans, we make such a ginormous difference in these four days. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. Jill? It's an exhausting four days. It's a fun four days, though. It's fun, and it's full of information, but at the end of it, you are wiped. Me included. At the yep. end of each day, I can't even really speak anymore. My brain is so done. It's just so much thoughts going through there. So, boot camp. <laughs> Where do we start? I think one of the first things is... When you're going past another dog, always look where you want your dog to go. It's just like driving. If you're skidding out on ice, look where you want to go, not where you don't want to end up. So hold your path, walk a straight line, no deking off into the ditch, loosen your shoulders, loosen your muscles, shorten your leash as much as you need to so your dog can't lunge and drag you with him but then loosen your shoulders so there's still that feeling of looseness for your dog and aim for where you're going. It's so easy to say that just like that. It is so hard to do it. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to do it. I've done your boot camp twice. And yeah, getting that through your head where you just need to go and basically not worry about your dog at that moment. You're just focusing on where you're going. It's hard. And I think that's it. There needs to be a list of jobs for the dog and for the human. And there is some overlap, but there comes a point where the human has to do their job and the dog hopefully has to do theirs. If they fail, you can bust them for it, but you need to focus on your own job. Yeah. And so often the reactivity you're seeing in dogs is cued by the person so to have them focused on something else and not their dog that in yeah. itself makes a huge difference jill how hard was it getting rid of the panic as you were focusing forward doing your job did panic override you sometimes or not oh many times and how did you remove it I, I don't know that I did. It was just repetition. It was probably you walking behind me with your cut-off golf club. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. So you work well with corrections? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I work well under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, That's very As funny. Once you see the first little bit of improvement or change in your dog, then it becomes easier. But until you see that... You're still expecting the worst. Well, I think that we should always expect the worst, but do our jobs. And then if you're expecting the worst, you can always be pleasantly surprised when they behave themselves. But if you're not expecting the worst, it will always take you by surprise and you won't be ready to react. You're always behind the eight ball. True. So to speak. Yeah. I think it's, it, I think it's more just, it's more seeing that your dog is capable of not being a dick. <laughs> I agree. When once you see that, then you can start to progress yourself. But yeah, you've got to see that that first step from them. Now, as we say, your dog being a dick, I get it because some of these dogs can't control themselves, but they don't also don't have to go postal either. They can try a little bit harder to keep it together. Absolutely. So. Even if they can't behave fully, that's okay. Not all dogs can, but they don't get to go postal. They need to give a little bit more effort than that. Yeah. Need to see some kind of improvement. Yeah. Okay. So we said focusing on where you're going, loosening your shoulder and keep your eyes on the mark of where you need to go. That was one. 
The next one is imagine in your head exactly how you want it to look as you go past the incoming dog. So visualize that, have it in your mind. But for me, I must always have plan B there of what if it doesn't go that way? I have to know what I'm going to do. So for me, just being positive and, oh, it's going to go well, we can do this. That doesn't cut it. I need to have a plan B in the back of my mind. Otherwise, just as I'm getting towards that dog, I start having doubt like, oh no, what if this doesn't work? What do I do then? But if I have that plan B in my mind, I'm ready. I can then just let that go. Let that moment of panic go so I can do my job calmly. Yeah. You're the same? Absolutely. Okay. And I think the hardest part with all of this is you have to stay active. You can't just passively walk the dog. It's, <laughs> my analogy with this is always like there's sitting on a horse and riding on a horse. There's walking a dog and walking with your dog. You actually need to actively be walking your dog. You can't just zone out and check your text messages or the rest of it. You need to stay mentally focused and do your job if you're struggling with a reactive dog. Yep. You always have to have one eye open. I read a book. I can't remember which one it was, but they talked about squirrel eyes. And it's, you basically always have to have your eyes open looking for the squirrel. Hmm. If, if a dog that's going to react, you're always trying to be one step ahead of them. And you need to be so aware of your environment and everything that's coming at you without letting your dog know you're so aware of your environment and everything coming at you. Yes. That's the key here. So you need to know that dog's coming up ahead, but nothing in your body should indicate that you saw it. Yep. That's just going to set your dog off if you're giving that away. All right. Our third one is walk your line and claim your path. We are Canadians here. So Sorry. I find this Sorry. fascinating. What? Being Canadian. You're apologizing for being Canadian? <laughs> Shut up, Jill. I'm just apologizing, period. (laughs) I'm actually British, so I'm not apologizing for being Canadian. All right. I have spent many hours. We have a pathway here in Victoria called Dallas Road. And Dallas Road is very populated. It's right along the shoreline, so it's very beautiful. And there's always people walking on there. And I've sat on a bench there and watched dogs and watched people because it's fascinating and I have weird hobbies. If I am watching like two women walk towards each other on that path, the women will each get out of the way. If it's a woman and a man walking towards each other on that path, generally the man will hold his path and the woman will still get out of the way. I find that fascinating. In my many hours of watching, there was only one time a woman didn't give up her path and she was a European woman and I wanted to cheer she just kept on walking towards that person it's almost like playing chicken with cars yeah there was a study done on that was there really yeah And? And, and you're right it was I can't remember what the stats were but the great majority of women move aside for men in all cultures yep oh wow interesting yep okay so Back to that, I have noticed this with dogs that I don't deke off my path. I hold my ground. So I look, I smile, and I keep walking in a straight line. There are exceptions to this. I always get out the way for mothers with children just because here we have reactive dogs and I don't mess with children. And obviously for elderly as well, I am British and have some manners here. So other than that, I hold my line. I might moderately bend out the way so two of us can fit on the pathway together but I don't deke out the way and get off the path so if it's a cement path or a gravel path you will not see me walking on grass I hold my line on that path and I think this is an incredibly important thing for our dogs too when we start deking out the way we are telling our dog that we need to give that other dog space because we are worried about it yeah Most of these reactive dogs are just picking up the pieces for us and fixing the issue. They're being really good dogs. We've told them we're worried about it because we're getting way out of the other person's way. So hold your path calmly. You can slow down a tiny bit, but hold your path. No more deking into ditches and hiding behind trees. 
unless the oncoming dog is being a, a total menace, then obviously <laughs> you're going to do what you need to do there. It took you a while there to think of a nice word, didn't it? <laughs> menace? <laughs> Because I had already used a bad word. <laughs> I heard the word you were going to use, and then I was surprised when you didn't use it. Oh, dear, you're bad. You know All right. Too well. <laughs> Loose leash walking. If we have any reactive dogs, they shouldn't be pulling on a leash. I get it. I, I'm not expecting perfect heel position, but your dog should not be ripping off your shoulder. And if you're d struggling with reactivity, enough is enough. They need to walk on a loose line. Give, well, give them less power. If they're pulling, they think that they're in control, and then it's all going downhill. I'm not sure if it's even control, but we may just change the terminology on that one. But if they're dragging you, they've got forward momentum. I want them to have neutral momentum. And they will have neutral on a loose line. That was Sizzle bringing her pineapple. Thanks. <clears throat> all is well and good with all of this. We can hold our path. We can walk towards a person with their incoming dog. We can keep our muscles loose. Our dog's not allowed to pull. But what happens when you see a dog coming towards you that scares you and you feel that bit of panic in you? Okay to answer? That's where I move. But I don't make a big deal out of it. Like it'll be just a, more of a request. Let's go this way instead. Okay. I think it, it does depend. So there's times it is appropriate to pick up your dog and run for the hills. Uh -huh. <laughs> We've all had those moments and there's nothing wrong with that. So long as you're not doing that daily. <laughs> yep. um, if I'm coming towards a dog that's e, I'm very mindfully going through the checklist in my head of walk your path, don't avoid them, um, open up my hands so in no way am I pulling tight on their line. It's short but there's zero tension coming from me. I'm swinging my arm as I'm walking and I just slightly slow down so that my dog gets to behave. My brain works the speed of my feet. So especially in that moment where I'm like, ah, this may not go well. Slow your feet down. If you slow your feet down, your brain will go a little bit slower. At least mine does. That's what I'm doing if I'm going towards a dog that panics me a little bit however there are also occasions that going towards that dog that I've done a mental calculation in my head of dog weighs 150 pounds woman is in high heels and weighs 90 pounds I'm running for my car <laughs> yeah I'm out it's okay to do that too yeah I will often like my dogs usually walk on my left side so when you're passing somebody if you're following traffic rules, you're going to pass dog to dog. And if I see anything that's sketchy, I'll just move my dog over to my right side. So I'm in between. I agree. Them. As you're walking, hold your line and just pass your leash behind your bum and pass your dog behind you to the other side. Yeah. You can do it quite smoothly. One thing that I make my people do in boot camp, because it's more working on themselves, is they have to write down everything they've done right on that walk. Now, this is journaling, and this takes a whole lot of time to do, so I'm not expecting this of my regular clients unless there's a very specific reason why. But years back, I started following Lanny Basham. I love Lanny. And doing his mental management program, and then attached to that, started doing his journaling system, and I love his journaling system. It helps you grow so much as a handler, as a trainer. Recently, I started doing Lanny's system again for Harry's tracking because I was struggling. David is doing it for his bite work because he's a helper. Sheila's supposed to be doing it for something. I can't remember what. <laughs> tracking, I think. <laughs> Allison, she's been doing it for her obedience. And she came back to class about a month after she started and was a different person because it's just so positive the way that he gets you journaling. By positive, I'm not saying things like, I'm a great handler. That's not what it is. He makes you focus on everything you did right. And by writing down what you did, you then get to rehearse it and remember again and you're not allowed to write down your failings. So you're only allowed to write down all the things you did correctly. 
And by writing them down, you then remember what your jobs are. So then it becomes more ingrained and more ingrained until it actually starts becoming you. That's totally just dumbed down his system, but that's a big part of it. Attached to that, he asks you each training session, what percentage did you run correctly mentally in your head? And I love that question. So that's in that moment of panic, were you able to calmly think through and do all of your jobs or did you just lose control of your brain entirely? And then the other one is technically, what part did you do correct? What percentage? If you are struggling getting to where you want to go, check out Lanny Basham and especially his journaling system. It may help you. Joe, have you ever done journaling like that? No, I've written down his name. <laughs> okay. Lanny was the first person I started with for mental management. And then from there, there were two other people that were like the next successive steps after Lanny. But Lanny is a, definitely a good one to start. But saying this, though, it takes time. Like, it really does. This isn't something you can just instantly be done with. You're looking at half an hour to an hour each time you do it. But I would say that time is almost more valuable than your training time because it starts making you think critically and work out what it is you are doing or not doing that you need to change. I ha I also have another belief from, and this is another one we do with all the reactive dogs. If I'm going past another dog with one of my client's dogs, my board and trains or whatever, and my board and train starts misbehaving, I will not continue moving forward until my dog behaves. So I often think as we're going past a dog, it's almost like holding our breath and closing our eyes and like driving through a tunnel like we used to do when we were children. Jill, did you do that or is it just me? That was just you. I held okay. my breath over the water. Okay, there you go. Over <laughs> bridges and water. Yep. Same thing. A lot of my clients are doing that going past a dog. So if your dog misbehaves, stop. Just stop your feet, take a deep breath, and just think your way through it. Get your dog behaving. But never pass another dog if your dog is misbehaving. Because I think it teaches them that the badder they are, the faster we'll get them through it. And then the faster that challenge is gone. They don't need to try. It's gone. We'll make it go away. So slow down. Calm yourself down. Stop if you need to. Deep breath. Loosen your muscles. Say something to the other person like, good morning. And if my dog's really misbehave him, would you like him? <laughs> so just be light and jovial. And even with the person that your dog's misbehaving to, say something witty. Like just show your dog through your own behavior how you want them to behave. Because I think with a lot of this, we are our dog's coaches. Absolutely. They've, they've somehow, they've missed the social lessons they needed to learn. And just through how we're behaving, we will teach them. I find this especially so with the street dogs. We are their coaches. It's not about leadership or anything like that. It's more we just need to coach them on this weird place that we brought them to and how we want them to behave. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty obvious that's the case when you can see one dog misbehaving with its owner and you hand the dog off to somebody else and the dog's completely different from one else. They're not getting that same feedback that they get from their owner. That's the moment that you want to kill them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're so ungrateful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, rotten dogs. They do make us better people. They really do. <laughs> One thing that is really hard for our reactive dogs, and it's be mindful of this, is standing still is so incredibly hard. If you have to pick up a poo or if you're looking on a map as to where you're going to go, is any of those moments you're standing still, getting to back to your car, rummaging for your keys, it's when you're standing still is when they're going to blow their lid. So be very mindful of standing still. It is something I try and train. However, it's not something that all dogs are capable of. So if I'm training this, I sit on a bench somewhere strategic where I'm far enough away from mayhem and craziness, but I'm still in a visible place. So my dog 
is seeing life go past them without everyone stopping to talk to us. So I'm just generally the other side of the street from where everyone is. And I'll stick them on my lap or I'll get them to hop up on the bench next to me and I groom them. Then if there's a big difficulty coming past, like a dump truck for a little dog that's scared of loud, noisy vehicles, I'm brushing more vigorously than I would have been a moment ago when there was nothing. So through my brushing, I want to give him something else to focus on. I often will cut toenails this way, like just take them out in public, wait till a motorbike goes past, that's the moment, pick them up, cut their nails, just keep on going. It gives them something else to focus to on when you're grooming in that way. And it's how I start teaching them to handle standing still, because that is way harder than moving. Interesting. I always wondered why you did your nails and grooming on the bus bench. (laughs) Now you know. No. Uh (laughs) This is just a mindset thing, but go hunting for victims. It's so much funner than trying to hide in the bushes and dreading everyone like actually want people. And now, as I say this, don't become obnoxious and be a creepy stalker. But (laughs) if you're actually looking forward to seeing people with their dogs, it does change things. It really does. And we all know this is true because as soon as you're dressed nice, how many, and you don't want to see people, you just have to quickly pee your dog. How many people do you see? It's always the way. Like when you don't want to see anyone, they're everywhere. Versus when you actually do, you go out on a training walk, you're all ready and there's no one out there. Murphy's Law. Yep. Also, don't be as reactive as your dog. (laughs) That can be hard sometimes. This one cracks me up. Lindsay, this was you, Lindsay and Finn, years and years ago. I think Lindsay is a dear friend of mine and has been now for many years. But I think she was probably my most reactive client ever. And her dog was probably a close second. (laughs) Oh, dear. But Lindsay would lose it on these unsuspecting people. (laughs) Oh, dear. Because they were looking at her dog. They tried to talk to her dog. They moved towards her dog. It was so funny. So Lindsay had to learn to let that go. And she's one of many. She's just one of the more memorable ones that makes me chuckle. Make sure you're not as reactive as your dog. (laughs) And it's hard because people are so annoying and stupid with some of the stuff they do, but you just have to let it go. Know that one day they too will have a reactive dog and they'll learn all their lessons then. Lindsay was the one that stopped, tried to stop me from being reactive. Oh, really? But that was a physical thing. She just came up and took me by the arm and made me keep walking. And I think it's funny because when you've had to work really hard to overcome something, you know how. You can then teach it. Yeah. Like it just comes naturally because it's been such a challenge. Kind of like me, I can teach people to be calm because I'm so frantic normally. (laughs) I think I can teach people to be calm. I don't really know what calm is. (laughs) (laughs) I can teach them my rendition of it, my faked version. I was going to say you can teach them how to fake it. Yeah. Eventually with our dogs, with all of our dogs, hopefully, with the street dogs, this is probably step one versus the end step. So it does change where this is going to be happening with dogs. We either have them off leash or we're going to have them on a flexi leash or a long line. We're giving them more freedom. And if I'm then going past by another dog, I will either call them back to me, hold their tab, just a short little cut off leash and send them past that person. But as the person's coming, it's going to be like, go on then, get going. And I'm just sending them forward. So I never want to teach these dogs to go and greet others. I'm just encouraging them to plow forward. Off you go now. With my little import dogs, I am doing this as step one with a flexi leash. I have way more success with these street dogs on a flexi than I do on a regular leash. They need that freedom and they are so much better with it. Border Collies too. Flexis are hated. They're a hated training tool by many, but they have a time and a place. They are such a fantastic tool when used correctly. Yeah, that's the thing. 
when used correctly. Just like anything though, right? Yeah. It's funny. Each dog sport that we have teaches us a piece of being a dog trainer. So I think herding makes us super aware of how to use our voices, our intonations, our tones. Is that the same thing, intonation and tone? <laughs> yeah, in tone. Oh, okay. Um, obedience, I think, teaches us how to teach exercises to dogs. Agility, I would say, is the one that teaches us how to get our dog going where our body suggests. So if we are looking at agility as to how those handlers know how to use their shoulders, their hips, their arms, their gestures, they can send their dog anywhere around a course by the slightest of movements, the slightest of movements and twists and weight balance with their bodies. Yep. All of us with our reactive dogs need to be looking to agility to learn how to use our bodies to stop sending our reactive dogs where we don't want them to go. Mm. I think there's a lot to be learned from agility people with this. Start copying them and start focusing on where you do want your dog to go versus where you don't. That's a big piece. Yeah. Anything good, else, Jilly? That's a good thought. Once in a while, I'm clever. Mm. Are you though? <laughs> <laughs> You're not very nice. What clever comments do you have? I'm just thinking of boot camp and if there was anything else that we did that we could touch on. Oh, I do. If ever I have a dog that's really struggling with something, like really struggling, like either getting in close with people, other dogs, I'm just not making headway, something like that. <coughs> best way to do it is either on public transit, which we're not allowed to do in Victoria, which sucks. Really? Yeah, we're not allowed dogs on the buses here because that's such a good way to get your dog in close to people if they're uncomfortable with people. We just it's, have to pay a dog another adult fee. Oh, cool. It's the same as like my grooming on the chair. By putting them on public transit, you've given them something else just to think about that takes their mind off the challenge of the people. With those dogs in Victoria, if I'm needing to do that, we have the harbor fairies. <laughs> We have these little water taxis, downtown Victoria. Oh, yes. And you can take your dogs on them. It is fantastic. It's such a good thing to do with your dogs. It really is. Just make sure you tip your nice driver. Yes. <laughs> it's so wonderful. <laughs> but it's a great way to get your dog sitting still, in close with other people, in close with other dogs, in the case of with me, because we're taking several of them on there. And they just sit nicely for their boat ride like it's super so harbor taxis are so much fun to be able to go do with our dogs yeah all right i think we're done jilly i got nothing else all right then all right we'll see you next tuesday sounds good yeah bye